Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Chapter 32, verse 1, the great book of Isaiah. Yahweh's salvation. That's the way you find it, is through our Father. We're, we're tangled up in these uh, woe situations, and um, we're, we're almost through them. But all of a sudden here in chapter 32, God tells us about a king you can appreciate. He tells us about someone you can appreciate. Um, so let's just, without further ado, a word of wisdom from our Father. Like a breath of fresh air, let's get into 32, verse 1. It reads, Behold, or you look here, not woe, but look here. A king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Well, what a change that would be. Total doing what's right, even and the underlings of that king, they're doing exactly what's right. And um, naturally, you know who that king is. It's Jesus Christ, king of kings, lord of lords. His underlings are his elect. Verse 2. And a man shall be as an hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. In other words, you know who this man is, don't you? That man is Christ, of course. He is our covert. You know, uh, you have to think of this as being in the desert in one of those old desert sandstorms that just, I mean, it just blisters your face to be out there. That you have him to stand behind. You always have Christ to stand behind. You have, when Christ is with you, you are protected from all things. And even providing the living water. And naturally, what is this great rock, this heavy rock in the Hebrew? It's Christ. He is our rock. Verse 3. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim. And the ears of them that hear shall hearken. They're going to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Finally, at last, many more, perhaps, even than God's elect, will be able to see the truth because it will be directly before them in this King of Kings. Verse 4. The heart also of the rash, or, or the hasty, shall understand knowledge. What a change. And the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. That, that's eloquently. Uh, when, when is that going to be? Well, when is it that we don't do the talking and the Holy Spirit speaks for us? That's God's elect as they're delivered up before the spurious Messiah, the Holy Spirit speaks through them as it is written in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, as well as many other places. That speech eloquently shall go forward. A truth. And the people that hear it, as a matter of fact, Luke 21 goes a little bit further. It states that even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say, for it is not you that speak, but the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, to continue. The vile person shall be no more called liberal. I don't, I, I you know, liberal has changed its values until... Uh, what it means in the Hebrew is noble. And I'm going to read it that way. Liberal has taken on kind of a communistic, socialistic trend. And I don't even like to use the word. Uh, having fought against communism up north, I lost a lot of good buddies to liberalism. And so naturally, I'm not real fond of it. So I'm going to translate it as it should be translated, noble. The vile person shall be no more called no noble nor the curl, that's to say the miser, said to be bountiful. In other words, um, a person that's covetous is not going to be able to be called um, bountiful. Uh, verse 6, for the vile person, that's Nabal, that, that uh, 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 person shall speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity, to practice hypocrisy 
and to utter error, that's to say lies, against the Lord, to make empty the soul of the hungry. And he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. That's, that's what Satan is good for, you know, is, is to take that away that God blesses with. Now, what have the last few chapters been about? Don't leave God out of the equation of your life. He furnishes blessings. If you follow the vile person, if you follow the curl, uh, you're going to end up without God's blessings, and you're going to thirst big time. Okay, You're going to do without big time. When, when this particular time rolls around, verse 7, the instruments also of the curl are evil. I mean, he dreams up evil things and he brings it to pass. Those instruments can be uh, contracts, uh, they can be loan agreements of usury, they can be uh, covenants made with nations. He deviseth wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words. Even when the needy speaketh right, even when the needy are doing what's right and trying their best, he's going to rip them off. He's going to do his best to rip them off. Now, um, an evil person, a vile person, follows the vile one. The vile one that is identified as the vile person of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And uh, that vile person, of course, is Satan himself, his ilk, and those that follow him. Verse 8, but the noble deviseth noble things. In other words, somebody that's really noble brings forth devi uh, um, uh, noble things. And by noble things shall he stand. He stands for good. And um, why? Because God will bless him. That's the way it is. You don't have to worry about it. He doesn't have to beg. And uh, God provides for those that do what's right. Especially at this time that we're reading of here. You don't have to wait for heaven to stand behind Christ in the storm of the end times. You can stand behind him now. He's there. He's there for you. And his promises are sure. You can count on it. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Verse 9. Rise up, you women that are at ease. Hear my voice, you careless daughters. Give ear unto my uh, speech. Th this is um, careless daughters is used uh, well, those that would practice self-confidence and it's said in irony. Okay, to get up, do something, but do it right. Okay, verse 10, many days and years shall ye be troubled, ye, care, ye careless women, for the vintage shall fail, the gathering shall not come. In other words, you're not going to be blessed. And, and um, that's just the way it happens. Without God's blessings, everything you touch, Everything you do ends up just about with naught. You may get by, but that's all you'll do is just get by in a poor way when you could be blessed for bringing God into your equation, for standing in the storm behind this king, which is to say Messiah, which is to say Christ, to allow him to protect you, to be your covert. That is to say, to protect you from everything. That isn't to say that you can't cut it, because you can. With his help, the storm doesn't bother you. Bring it on. Can-do type people. Why? They serve God, and God is in their life, and God blesses. 11. Tremble, you women. This is symbolic of Israel that doesn't believe in a way or isn't following. Tremble, you women that are at ease. Be troubled. Ye careless ones, strip ye, and make you bare, and gird sackcloth upon your loins. In other words, um, you're going to have a sad old time of it. 
Now, it, you're supposed to be doing something is what God, I hope you get the point here. You're supposed to be bringing God into the equation of your life. You're supposed to be talking to him, consulting him, consulting his letter, whereby he can, where he'll have a reason to bless you. If you don't give God a reason to bless you, I, you rest assured, he won't. You won't have to worry about it. You might as well get set up. You're, you're, in, for, you're in for a sad, old, miserable time. For many years, without that king, without Christ. Verse 12, they shall lament for the teeth, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. This is that you hire uh, people to beat their breast when there's sorrow and, and shame. So you're, you're going to have to, and that is masculine, you're going to have to do a lot of hiring, for you're going to have a lot of sorrow, a lot of grief to bear. Verse 13, upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars, yea, upon all the houses of joy in the joyous city. All those happy homes are not going to have any happiness there. They're going to fall apart. Why? They're not consulting God. One of the chapters prior, running off down to Egypt for protection, protecting in armies, uh, uh, gaining protection or feeling protected by armies, by mortal men, and leaving God out of the equation. God is promising you, you better get ready for some sackcloth because your happy home is not going to be happy any longer. This means he's going to tighten the screws a little bit. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Thorns and briars make one of the hottest fires there is. They don't amount to too much and it doesn't last long, but boy, they sure make a hot fire. And this joyous city, of course, is what? It's Jerusalem. That when, after the Antichrist sets foot there. Verse 14. Because the palaces shall be forsaken, that's neglected. The multitude of the city shall be left. The forts and towers, that's even the tower of Ophel, if you would, shall be for dens forever, a joy for wild asses, a pasture of flocks. For, for that period of, of neglect, it's going to go downhill to where it isn't fit for anything. Do you understand why? You should. Because not this king that we started with in this chapter, but the false king is going to stand there. And it's nothing but downhill and neglect after that. Standing in the holy place as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, claiming to be God, standing on the mountain of God. It's going downhill all right. A place for wild asses. You can count on it. Verse 15. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high. Oh, what Spirit is that? The Holy Spirit, of course. And the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. This, this loses a little bit in the translation. What this is saying in is that when that Spirit comes from down on high, what we call a garden that produces now, we're going we're gonna to throw that away because he's produced much better in where the forest was. Reclamation. Reclaiming. Making beautiful. Not, not neglected, but loved and tended. Because why? Because the Spirit came, comes down from on high. But, beloved, let me ask you something. Think about this equation. When does that spirit come down from on high? Well, let me see. It came down from on high 40 days after Christ was crucified, and then a 10-day wait, and that Holy Spirit came down from on high on the 50th day called Pentecost to give us an example of exactly how it would be. What, what am I saying? I'm saying... Even now, if you believe and if you get behind the, the uh, Messiah, 
<clears throat> this king, that that Holy Spirit is still with you. It's already here. It's already here from on high to bless what you do when you follow him and when you love him. <clears throat> and even what we call fruitful now will be put to shame in a way by what is produced at that time by what our Heavenly Father does for us. What I'm telling you is something much better is coming. Verse 16. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness with re, righteousness remain in the faithful, fruitful field everywhere. Because God, God is in control. Is there any wonder why you should consult with him? Is it any wonder why that you should take him into the equation of your life? Because he blesses. And he's showing you here the, the proceeds or the profits of his blessing is plentiful. Everything. 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. Not just calling it peace, but real peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My, what a time to live. What a place to be. It's to be with our Father. And then, just a little caution and a little reminder, He could be with you today. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is receive. Verse 18, and my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation. They will have a happy home. And in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. Resting is Sabbathing. What a Sabbath that's going to be. What a hab high Sabbath. Because that king, that king that we read of in verse 1 becomes our Passover where anything wicked must pass over us. What a blessing and what a time to be. <clears throat> now, I want to say a word about this 19th verse. I feel that it belongs after the 14th verse. It's kind of out of order, but that's fine. I can read it that way and we'll leave it stay. But what we're going to do, the Assyrian is being punished and we're going to revert back now to this, not this happy place, but back to the sadness that we had fall at during verse 14. We read 19, and you make your own mind up, and uh, I, I feel as a teacher I owe it to you to tell you, though. Verse 19 reads, When it shall hail, coming down on the forest, and the city shall be low in a low place. Now, this is not the place we were just talking about Jerusalem reclaimed. This is Nineveh, the city of the Assyrian, that type of false Christ. And again, uh, that verse belongs after following 14 before these good blessings begin. But be that as it may, we can leave it there and it'll fly, fly just fine as long as you understand what city we're talking about. Nineveh and its destruction. Why? Because it took advantage God used it as a rod and it overdid what God would ask it to do. Now, back to the restitution. Okay, verse 20. Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters, that send forth thither the feet of the ox and the ass. What, what blessed translates happy. <clears throat> Do you understand? Don't read over that. You know, many people are couch potatoes or they go to a church where they're just a pew potato. They never do anything. They, um, and what did it say here? It said, blessed are ye that sow beside all waters. They're doing something. They're sowing truth. They're living it. They're participating in it. And naturally, that's, they um, send forth, uh, they're working the very soil itself with the feet of the ox and the ass. Uh, uh, and, and it means, in a way, they're ranging free and sowing and doing God's work. 
So that's what you need to do. Do you want his blessings? If you really want to be super blessed, that's what you do. You share the truth. You, you protect your credibility. I'm not telling you to go out on some corner and shout to the high heavens. That, that would be idiocy and you would be called an idiot. And no one listens to an idiot. Okay. So when an opportunity prevails, plant that seed. And how your father loves you for that. Because you're doing something. You're sowing. You're sowing seed to all beside all waters. That means sow it where you know it's going to produce because it will be watered. That's, that's why you pick and choose and feel free for free pasture, free grazing rights, free feeding rights to the truth of Almighty God. What a beautiful chapter. This chapter 32 providing that prince and the king the princes I should say and the king being God's elect and the Messiah himself and the sowings of seeds of truth that bring joy and happiness and contentment to a very troubled world a troubled world where the storm is brewing and the east wind is blowing the blistering heat is building but with Christ, you're protected. Let it come. We know, we know from prophecy the end times are kind of tough times for those that are not with him and behind that rock and on that rock. And that rock is Messiah. What a beautiful chapter and what a beautiful message. Chapter 33 and verse 1. Here we come to the fifth of the six woes. Listen to it. Woe to thee, that spoileth the... Do you know who the old spoiler is? That's one of Satan's names. And of course it has to do with the Assyrian, that type. Uh, and, um, and, and so it is. And thou wast not... Uh, woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not, and thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously. And they dwelt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled, and when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, thou shalt deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. This is, uh, old Snacharub was the, the uh, type for this, the king of Assyria. And he did deal treacherously, but God, God let him correct the people, but God doesn't like it when people touch his children. So what he's saying is when it's over with that old spoiler, there's a special place for him. You know what it is called. It's the abyss, the pit. That's where ultimately this, this being the type, but the real thing, being Satan himself, is going into that abyss for the millennium. His spoiling days will be over with for a while. Okay. Verse 2. O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm. Every morning our salvation also in the time of trouble. In other words, um, um, not their arm, but our arm. Be there for us. Be strong for us. Uh, and it's important that you know what was said there and that you don't let it slip away from you. We have waited for thee. They're not those hasty ones we read about in a prior chapter that falls off to the first Messiah that comes along. They wait for the true Father. There's going to be a wedding and he expects virgins for that wedding. We're speaking spiritually. People that were not deceived by the spoiler. People that were not deceived by the Apollyon, which is to say the uh, he who does destroy, which is uh, the adversary, which is to say Satan. We wait for the true Father. Verse 3, At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. 
In other words, um, when the enemy was coming, um, the people did scatter. Verse 4. And your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar as the running to and fro of locust shall he run upon them. Um, he's going to strip the Assyrian army. They're going to be spoiled. And just as the um, uh, just as his children um, and the locust army stripped Israel, he's going to get stripped. His time is coming. Verse 5, the Lord is exalted for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. Jerusalem is going to receive that justice and righteousness. Ultimately, what will be right will be right, and what is wrong will be tagged and labeled wrong. Verse 6, listen carefully now. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. What gives you stability? Don't read over that, beloved. I'll ask it again. What gives you stability? Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. The reverence of Almighty God is your treasure. Why? Because it brings forth the knowledge. To begin, as it is written in the Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 1, verse 7, reverencing the Lord, it, the word is fear or revere. Revering the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. And that's your stability. That gives you stability in all, in the storm, in the time of trouble. It gives you stability when things are rough. Why? Because he's with you. And, and you are sowing his seed in the right places by the water. Not out where it's never going to have an opportunity, but where it should be, in fertile ground. And your loving him is a treasure because it brings great dividends. Seven, behold thy valiant, valiant ones shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. Um, when Sennacherib, Sennacherib was coming, the Assyrian, they sent out ambassadors. He kind of laughed at them. Okay. He, payday comes. What goes around comes around. And I'm speaking historically now. Uh, he really made light of them. He was going to conquer. He, he could care less about peace. Uh, he was going to conquer. Verse 8, the highways lie waste. The wayfaring man ceaseth. Uh, um, that, that's just, you might say the mortal flesh ceaseth. Uh, he has broken the covenant. He hath despised the cities. He regardeth no man. That, we're talking about the Assyrian. They'll cry peace, peace, peace. They'll send ambassadors, but there will be no peace. Now, I want you to understand this real good because prophetically, what does it mean? We're going to do road maps. We're going to do try for peace. We're going to shoot for it and everything. But do you think that the Antichrist is going to be dealt with? Do you think you're going to talk him out of it and he's going to say, well, let us just have peace and let the Lord come? And there's no way. He's going to stand in the holy place claiming to be God. It doesn't matter how many ambassadors you send. It doesn't matter how much you beg, how much you plead, or what you do, or what kind of covenant you might want. There is no way that you can talk the Antichrist out of doing what he's going to do. And this type was the same way couldn't phase him. You could cry peace, peace, peace all you wanted to, but there would be no peace. Verse 9, the earth mourneth and languisheth. Uh, Lebanon is a shame and hewn down. Sharon, that, that, that's the plain where it's good fertile ground. It's like a wilderness. And Bashan, that's the fruitful place. 
and caramel. Um, that's the fragrant fruitful place. Shake off their fruits. In other words, um, um, uh, it, it, um, before it's time, it withereth, doesn't produce. And, and the old great cedars of Lebanon, which is symbolic of our people, they're going to mourn all right when that one comes. And really what you're reading is a type of the Assyrian that would come, and he is the type of Antichrist that would come in the end times. You'll remember back in the 14th chapter of this great book of Isaiah, I told you to mark old Lucifer, son of the morning, which means the bright morning star. Because Lucifer claims to be the morning star, just like Christ does. In other words, he's a fake. He's an imitator. That the Assyrian in that 14th chapter is set up. You with companion Bibles, it will draw it out for you and explain it as a type of Antichrist. But you're covering it here. And um, there will be no dealing with him. Verse 10. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now. Will I be exalted? Now will I lift up myself? That time will come. Verse 11, you shall conceive chaff. You shall burn, bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. I want, I want you to get that picture. Our, our father has a very direct way of putting things. He said, you're going to be impregnated, all right, being with the false Christ. And you're with what? You're, you're going to conceive chaff, and you're going to bring forth stubble, and your own breath is a burning fire, meaning you're going to burn yourself up. And that's how much sense it makes for someone to follow false teaching. You destroy yourself. I'll say it again. You conceive chaff. You bring forth or give birth to stubble. That's grass. And your own breath is a burning fire and you destroy yourself. That's how much sense it makes, friend, to follow this false one. To be misled by traditions of men rather than following the true God. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast.